I'd like to introduce you to the three speakers. Um, we all work for Google, and we're going to talk to you about uh, Java ME testing. So I'm Julian Harty. I've been in the company two and a half years, uh, working purely in mobile QA. Uh, Michaela Sammer, who's a PhD intern and been doing the bulk of the work that you're going to see today. And Olivier Gallard, who is a software engineer in test, been in the company a couple of years as well, and uh, basically helped us to improve the code and did some stunning work. And it's a good example of Google working together. So um, how many of you got one of these things? How many of you written software for one of these things? Oh, good, a couple of you. So it's easy, isn't it? OK, maybe not. So we're going to talk about how we do um, system level test automation using a tool that we've written called J Injector. We're hoping to make this tool open source. It'll take us a couple of months to sort out the details. And if anyone would like specific details, just get in touch with any of us directly by email afterwards. And if not, then hopefully you'll see an announcement on code at google.com. So Java ME, which used to be called J2ME, so you'll hear us use both terms. Um, what's the main constraints of it? The first thing is that this little thing ain't got four gigabytes of memory. If you're lucky, your phone's got 64 megabytes of memory, but some of them are down to less than a megabyte. And the original specification required you to run your application in about 128 kilobytes. It has a limited number of threads, so the more powerful devices have about 15 threads, which sounds like a lot until you look at the complexities of some of our applications where we're hitting a hard thread limit there. We have limited processing power, so the software tends to be optimized to run these devices. Now, J2ME came about and is very basic. Um, it was for mono screens and potentially no screens at all, so there was no concept of accessing the file system. It was just the minimum Java that you could fit on a device. So how does this device and our software actually work? Um, it takes advantage of things called JSRs, Java specification requests, which are run through a community process, and people decide whether they want to implement these on a device-by-device -device basis. Um, the modern devices support something called MIDP2, which is um, a refresh with a certain minimum number of JSRs. And the application model is a midlet lifecycle, which I'll talk about briefly in a minute. The user interface is called the LCD UI, a very basic user interface. Think back 15 years ago on the desktop, and this is roughly where we are today with mobile devices. Recently, Sun has announced the lightweight UI toolkit, which I don't think many people have yet adopted, but in theory, it improves the whole UI development. But typically, our applications don't take advantage of that yet. In terms of test automation, J2ME unit is about all we've got. It's probably about six or seven years old now, um, and it hasn't really moved on much from there. It's intended purely for unit testing. Now, before I go any further, I'm going to take you to one of our applications. So this is a YouTube application, and we're going to start some tests running on this. Now, these tests are going to take a few minutes to run, so we'll come back to them later on. Uh, the tests normally run fully automatically in a continuous build process. So you'll notice in the background that we're using the standard capabilities of the Java toolkit to monitor things like the HTTP traffic if we're interested in recording that. And we can monitor memory usage and things like that. Going back to the slides then. So Google and our clients. Typically, our clients are front ends for other services. How many of you use Gmail? Uh, more than two. I should ask about other mail services, but maybe not in this conversation. So how many of you use the mobile client? OK, a good number of you. So we have a mobile client. It's optimized to get your messages to and from you over potentially expensive network connections. So the client has to run on constrained phones, but it runs on probably 50, 60 different main phone models. Typically, we have about 50% of our code dedicated to the UI. So our applications are GUI-driven, and they're driven by events generally pressed in by the user. So the user presses the soft keys, and our applications respond to the soft keys. The servers do work. They send responses back over the air. On a good day, that takes a few seconds. But in congested networks and with other problems, it might take 10 or 15 seconds. What it means is we can't just rely on a fixed timeout for doing things like waiting for an event to complete. We ship lots of data over the air, so your emails, for instance, videos on YouTube. And we have to be able to deal with those in our tests, how to be able to detect when there are problems there. Typically, 
the way that we test these applications, I suggest most of the people in the industry test these applications, is a combination of unit tests, which test relatively little, and manual exploratory testing, which means people sitting with boxes. Now, yesterday, um, I think it was James Whitaker asked how many people have phones, lots of phones to test with. Well, I personally own 30 phones. I have roughly 500 in the office, and that isn't enough to test these applications. Now, imagine I was going to test an application by hand for an hour on even 50 phones. That's more than my week, and perhaps I'd run 10 test cases per phone. So it doesn't really scale very well. Moving on now to the midlet life cycle. So midlets are specified by Stun, Sun sorry, and the JVM. They run in a sandbox, which means they're not supposed to access the file system, and we can't start them. We have no control over them. So it's started by the runtime environment. They have a defined life cycle, which is a very simple life cycle. So the application is started. It can be active or paused or destroyed. When it's paused, we're supposed to release resources. Resumed, we get the resources back we need, and then eventually we're destroyed. And the applications can't share memory. And this is important from the test automation perspective. So I'm going to hand over to Michaela now. How many of you have ever implemented an application using LCDI, the standard graphic to toolkit for Java Microedition? One? OK. So this is a sample of code which I took from, from the Nokia forum. I actually simplified it. And this code is actually, once compiled and deployed, is creating that application on the left. So it's an empty form with a search button. In these few lines of code, we have already two really important concepts for lc -DUI. The first one is, in order to put anything on screen, we need to have a reference of our midlet. And the way in which it works is by accessing the midlet, we have a reference to the display. And in that display, we print something. We display our form. The other important concept is lc -DUI, it's a command-driven uh, graphic toolkit. So in order to fire event, we need to fire commands. And this is actually the way in which uh, this is the suggested implementation. So a comparison between the receive the command that the listener is receiving and the command which was stored in internally somewhere. And if these two instances are, dis are matching, then the event is handled. So, sorry. Uh, yesterday we saw how to test, how to automate the testing for a, a simple application using Groovy. Let's suppose that we want to test the same application but using a mobile device. So let's suppose that we have a, an application containing a search form, and in that search form there is a text field in which the user is supposed to type some, some keyword, and then there is a search button which the user can press and in order to trigger the search. The code in this slide is showing a possible implementation for that test. So th the first thing that we need to do is to retrieve an instance of the element on screen, and then we can use type checking to confirm that that is actually an instance of our search form. And then uh, we don't know if the, f the text field will be private, protected, or public, so we can use reflection in order to assess any field of that instance. And if we find actually our text field, we can then inject the, the keyword that we want to use for our test. And with the same approach, we could uh, hypothetically find the command, and then we could fire this command, and we could start the search, and then our, our test will run this keyword. Uh, we can also implement uh, some API which will make this, uh, which will hide this from our tester, and we can iterate or toward all the instances until we don't find the right instance that we want to test. However, Java Micro Edition doesn't support reflection, and it doesn't either support in, uh, introspection, so this code will actually not compile. It's actually not possible to implement this test like this. And the original assumption that we can get a reference of the element on screen implied that the middle that we are executing is actually our application. Unfortunately, if we try to create a test suite using J2Me unit, we will uh, soon realize that the test runner itself is a midlet. So we're, when we are executing the display, get current display on the midlet, we will actually get a reference of, on, on the, the element that the test runner is displaying, not the element that we would like to test. So actually, the example has 
that I showed before, it's impossible. But we can, we can automate testing for J2Me, for Java Micro Edition, using, using something that we found in the literature. So we found this uh, uh, RoboTME. RoboTME, it's, uh, it's a framework for record and replay events on a CDI. It's based on ASAM, which is a library for bytecode instrumentation from object web. And the way in which it works is during the record session, it actually logs all the, all the command events which are fired. And during, when the application is instrumented in order to replay those events, the application is tested and, and the expected behavior is verified. Unfortunately, this implementation is highly coupled with lc 2 i so it, it only allows to test application using lc 2 i as a, as a GUI. And it assumes that all the events will have the same latency. So if you, if you want to test an application using different carriers, using under different network condition, this is not enough for us. Moreover, this library assumes the right is playable to be on screen, and this is something that we don't want. We need to, to wait for, up, for our application to react, and this is a strong constraint, especially if you want to, to test applications which are making queries on remote backends. We also need code coverage to measure the quality of our test, to give a sort of measure of which quantity of the application we, we are testing, and unfortunately, the the most used tool for code coverage, Emma, that cannot run with, within Java Micro Edition because Java Micro Edition doesn't support custom class loading. As far as we know, the only other tool for code coverage on mobile is Cobertura Mobile. Cobertura Mobile is supporting of Cobertura, which is a tool for Java Standard Edition. It is, it is really well designed. It has a very good object orientation internally. Unfortunately, such a good design when applied to the mobile world generates an application which is too slow. And it becomes so slow that it's sometimes impossible to test it because it, the test reach a timeout because the application is not consistent anymore with the behavior that it should have. However, even Cobertura instrument the application. So we found that this instrumentation will be the right direction in which to explore. And we ended up implementing our instrumentation tool with J-Injector. And we followed three base principles. Well, we wanted our tool to be general purpose. So the, the instrumentation is general purpose, and then we, we instrument the feature that we want our application to have. Here today, we are showing two of them, the end-to-end -end testing and the code coverage, but we have other features. Then we wanted our tool to be multi-platform. Uh, we support Java Micro Edition and, and BlackBerry RIM, we also apply the injector to Android, but Android doesn't have all the limitation of the micro edition, so it doesn't really make sense to use the injector on it. And we want also to support multiple graphic libraries, so not only lc 2 i or the, the other framework from Sun, but also custom library that we have internally. And the most important thing, we want the instrumented version to be optimized for mobile. We want to minimize the computation that our instrumented code is inserting, and we want to reduce the footprint because this instrumented version is going to, to run in a device in which the memory is strongly limited. So how can we use this tool inside our build process? So we are suggesting two possible usages. The first one is on the fly, and the second one is after a deployment. So on the fly, starting from the compiled class, we can instrument them, and J-Injector introduced reference to a set of support classes which need to be compiled, and all these two sets of classes need to be pre-verified together, and then the obtained code will be deployed in a couple of JAR and JAD. That deployment block here is a single block, but we have a deployment for each different model that our product is supporting. So for example, we will have a deployment for Nokia X60, a deployment for Sony, and so forth. Or we could instrument the application after a deployment. So starting from each single couple of JAR and JAD, we could instrument the contained bytecode. And then we need to compile the required support classes. We will pre-verify all the code to God, together. And then we will deploy once again the application. The difference between these two approaches is that in the first one, we only instrument the application one. And then we customize the deployment. In the second one, 
we start from a, from an application which has already been deployed, and then we instrument it. So to instrument multiple deployment, we need to instrument the application more than once. Then the question is, why did we need to instrument the application? Why we, we just didn't insert some, some extra code in, in our source code? Well, there are a few reasons for that. First of all, uh, some classes, some, some code cannot be of easy access. So let's suppose that a code is shared between multiple projects. Developers don't, don't really like to allow us to, in, to insert code which might modify the behavior of their application. And moreover, the design for our end-to-end -end testing is really different than a good design for, for a production code. So for instance, uh, production code needs to be small, needs to encapsulate fields, need to, to remove methods which are not needed. And while on the other end, end-to-end -end testing needs to, to expose as much field as, as it needs. So we decided that instrumenting the code, it was making sense for us. And the other point is, uh, we might need to do something similar to dependency injection, but apply it to mobile. So let's suppose that we have an application which is using a certain backend. We could inject a dependency to a testing backend, which is failing in, in, some, in some way that we know, and we could test our application against those failure. So let's, uh, let's have a look at to an example of one of our tests. This is a test applied to YouTube mobile in which we are replaying the last performed search. Our test follow a, a given pattern, and the idea is that initially we assert a set of precondition, and then we fire events. We wait for the application to react to those events, and then we assert a set of post condition, and we continue with that pattern. So in this example, at the beginning it is necessary to check the, the initial state of the application. The initial state for this test is that the home screen will be displayed and that the search button will be focused. If that is not verified, our test will fail and it will report that something, up, that something wrong happened. That implies that the application after a startup is not in, in a state which is known as, as the initial state. If those assertions are passed, then we can fire a right-click event. That right-click event will be automatically processed by the application and it will select the search button and it will display that search pop-up dialog with all, the, with all the search which has been performed previously. At this stage, we need to wait for the dialog to be loaded in memory and displayed on screen. Once, it is, once the dialog is displayed, we need to assess, to assess the validity of the dialog. So we need to check it's contained and we need to check that it's displayed correctly. If the dialog, if the dialog doesn't appear, then our test will fail. If the content of the dialog is not correct, so for example, if the new search field is not selected, our test will fail because that is not the state that we expect in the application. If that, if that is verified, then we can go on and we will fire a down key event and we will wait for the second entry in that dialog to be selected, in this case, the star. And then when that happens, we can fire a right click event which will start a search. And here we need to wait for the searching for pop up dialog to appear, and we need to wait for the dialog also to disappear, which will imply the end of our search. At this stage, the application can fail for different reasons. So for instance, if, if we don't have any network connection, or if the backend doesn't, doesn't transfer in, into a given time, the, this searching for dialog will disappear, and an error message will appear. And here, our, our test need to, to check this condition and need to report the right error message. If everything goes well, a result screen will, will be displayed. And at this stage, our test can verify that the result screen is correctly displayed on screen, and it can also verify the correctness of the result. So in this example, I'm showing the code of, of a test which is trying to search for GTAC, and which is verifying that GTAC will, will, re, will return a result containing J-injector. So, the purpose of this slide is to show that we can encapsulate all the logic of our test and we can create API in order to hide the, the ugliness of firing event. And, and we can create tests which are really easy to maintain. So the idea here is that we are following the page, the, the page object layout as it, as it happened for web development. And test writers just need to, to invoke those objects and to fire and to invoke this method 
as if they were using the application themselves. All of those methods are blocking, and internally they trigger the application, they fire the right event, and they wait for, uh, for those conditions to be met. And if something happened, they, they throw an exception, they fire event saying something went wrong. And it's really easy to understand what went wrong because we know exactly which one of these calls is failing. So as I mentioned before, um, using J2Me unit is impossible to obtain an instance of the element on screen because J2Me, the test runner of J2Me unit is a midlet. So we had to implement our test runner. And in this slide I'm showing how, we've, how we start our test runner, both for, for a midlet and both for a RIM application. In a midlet, we, we can start our test runner at the end of the startup method. Uh, we can do that because we know that that method will return. Um, on the other hand, in RIM application, start from a main method, and at the end of the, of the main method, they start a, an event dispatcher method, which will not return. So we need to start our test runner before the invocation of the event dispatcher. So when we, when we instrument our application with, with these two lines of code, depending from the type of application, then during the execution, after the startup, the application will run a test suite, which will be executed into a parallel thread. And, and all the tests will have access to a certain entry point on the application, which will, is, is, will they use to, to start the testing. So now let's go back to our demo and let's see the result of our test suite. So the, uh, if any of you ever executed a test suite using J2Me unit, uh, J2Me unit is not displaying error messages on screen. It's only logging them on the console. So if you run a J2Me unit test suite in, in a real device, you will have the number of failing tests, but you will not have an error report, which, which make not, not really useful the test suite itself. So this is the, report, the error report of our test runner. And in this case, we have a test failing. Now, the error message is that a search result for, for a query star, which was the test I showed you before, was empty. So this, this was an acceptance test, which was checking the compliance between this client and the backend, the normal backend for YouTube. And when we wrote this test, the specification said that the star was supposed to, to be a sort of wild chart returning a full set of results while performing this in this client returned an empty result. So this is a violation of those specification. And starting from this, we could explore the set of call of this search and, and, we could, and the, it is possible for our tester to, to realize what went wrong in this search. Okay, now Olivia will talk about code coverage. So we, uh, we show that using instrumentation, we can uh, uh, run end-to-end -end tests uh, on the J2Me apps. Um, I'm though going to speak about another feature of J-Injector, which allows us to uh, um, get code coverage uh, from our tests. So why do we need to uh, create such a, such a tool? Because there are already uh, lots of uh, tools like that um, out there. So for instance, uh, tools like uh, MR, uh, Cobertura already exists uh, and our open source projects. So we, we had to uh, create uh, another tool because um, the, the tools um, that are out there are not optimized for uh, J2ME apps. Um, and that's true for lots of other tools. So uh, for instance, test framework like JUnit or uh, TestNG are not going to work with a J2ME app. Um, L mocking libraries like uh, EasyMock or J JMock are not going to work either. Uh, static analysis tools, uh, and so on and so on. So it's really a challenge uh, when writing a J2ME app because lots of the tools we are used to use to improve the quality of our software are not available. So when we designed this co coverage feature, we had in mind to have something really optimized to have a small memory footprint and to use as few CPU as possible. Uh, the J2ME apps already use lots of uh, the memory available and the CPU available on the device. Uh, so we needed to use as few resources as possible. 
So here's an example of uh, three test runs. Uh, the first one is uh, when we uh, disabled the um, code coverage, I mean tests running without any instrumentation. So it's uh, a set of tests from a, a common library uh, used at Google. Um, so the, the second uh, test run is uh, using um, tests that has been instrumented by J-Injector, and we gather uh, the code coverage data. And the third one is the same uh, using Cobertura. So you can see that uh, there is um, J-Injector only add a, a, a small overhead, uh, and it's really fast to execute the tests and gather the coverage data. So I think that uh, speed matters a lot. Um, we spoke about uh, test execution speeds in other talks. Uh, we want the test to be fast. Uh, one of the reasons is that um, developers are going to run their tests more often if the tests are fast. And that's the same, um, we can apply the same uh, uh, ideas to uh, uh, other tools like code coverage tools. So if it takes ages to uh, get a code coverage report, uh, developers are less likely to uh, use the, the tool of, often. So another thing we wanted to uh, uh, optimize is a memory footprint. So um, one idea we had in order to uh, uh, have a small memory footprint is to cut one of the features, which is uh, uh, used in, in a common code coverage tools. Um, in the report, usually uh, uh, you have, for each line, you have the uh, number of times a line has been executed. And it takes lots of memory to uh, uh, store that for, for each line. So we, we chose to only uh, store if a method has been executed at least once, uh, and we can store that in, in one bit. So uh, it helped, uh, helped us uh, to, uh, to optimize the memory. And we also add other uh, optimization. Um, so now I'm going to show you, um, I mean, to explain uh, how we implemented the, uh, the, the code coverage, um, gather, uh, gathering code coverage data. So we used, uh, as Michele mentioned earlier, we use a tool uh, as object web. Uh, it's a library that allows to browse the uh, bytecodes really easily. And uh, you can, uh, it's using a really smart way to do it, um, using a visitor pattern. And you can really easily specify that you want to add a method call uh, for this class, for this method. So what we need to do for uh, to gather code coverage, first, we want to uh, initialize some data uh, structure in order to store afterwards uh, which line has been uh, covered. Uh, so that's what is done by the activate coverage methods, which is a static method from, from the coverage class. Uh, and we do that in the... Uh, during the uh, the midlet initialization, and the second thing we want to do is at the end of the of the uh, when the application stops, we want to write a data file uh, that contains all the all the information we gathered. So we do that using the uh, collect coverage uh, method. Um, and once we have that, uh, we need to fill our data structures. Uh, so the way to do it is to uh, for each line uh, of code that can be executed, we added, uh, using the instrumentation, a method um, in order to um, uh, specify uh, that the, the line has been executed. So here, 56 is an arbitrary number. I mean, it's a unique ID which is going to uh, identify this line, and afterwards we, could, we can map this index to the, uh, the class name and the, and the line number. So, once we um, stored, once we gathered all this information, uh, at the end we can write uh, a data file uh, to the file system. So if, it, if we run the code coverage tool on a mobile device, we will have to uh, uh, get it from a USB, for instance. Uh, it's a file which is using the LCOV format, and afterwards using this file, uh, we can easily generate a HTML uh, report. Um, I don't know if you have heard about uh, GCOV, um, it's uh, one of the tools uh, uh, from this package is, is uh, HTML gen, which allows to create a, a really nice report and you can browse uh, your source code by, by package with the, the code coverage um, data 
overlaid uh, on this report. Right. So why do we bother with all this? Well, here's an example of some of the benefits we had. So the first is we're able to test the event handlers and event listeners for the applications. Uh, simply, it's impossible to test that for JTOME applications without doing code injection. Um, we were able to detect a number of bugs in our applications, some of them quite mature applications, where it turned out that developers hadn't realized that some of their changes had affected the way the items appeared on screen, and the manual testers hadn't spotted it either, because, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a limited time available for testing on lots of different devices. The second thing is that we can leave tests running. So at the beginning of this talk, I left a bunch of tests running for about 10 minutes. We can leave tests running overnight um, on devices and then come back in the morning and look at things like the memory leaks. And again, we've found a number of memory leaks in our applications, which all helps to make them more robust. Probably for the first time ever, I think, we're able to actually test on real phones. So rather than running in emulators, as I demonstrated um, on the laptop. So typically, people would do their tests in an emulator because they can't fit them on phones. Now, one of the benefits of doing it on phones is we trip up over all sorts of permissions issues, um, incomplete supports of JSRs and things like that, which, again, we simply couldn't test any other way. Uh, we can inject uh, dependencies into the code so we can modify even very hard-to-test applications. And I'll touch on that a little bit later on. Code coverage um, was a poor cousin in terms of mobile. So at Google, you've heard various people talking about good testing practices, and code coverage is one of them. But there weren't any tools, so the tests were running blind, effectively. It was up to the developers to look at the results. And now we can actually give them standard code coverage in our standard tools using standard file formats, the LCOV format. Now, it all sounds simple, and you've seen a couple of screens that show you two or three lines of code and a pretty graph. Well, that's taken about a year to get make happen, to make it pretty and easy. And the nice thing for developers is that these system tests are actually written in a style that models JUnit and JTOME unit. So it means they don't have to learn yet another way of writing their tests. So life isn't perfect. Um, and here's some examples of the challenges we face. So the first is that it does introduce overhead. Typically, an application, when it's instrumented with code coverage and tests, is two to three times the size it was. So that means we do have to work hard to squeeze it onto a phone. So even starting up the YouTube tests on my Sony Ericsson phone takes about two or three minutes. So that's quite a long time. Still better than me sitting there and testing it manually, I promise you, but longer than we'd like. The second is, it's one of those paradoxes that we now have a new way of automating the testing. Developers like automated testing, but when we actually present re results to them, they say, ah, but can we reproduce it on a real phone? Maybe it's your instrumentation code that's causing the problem. You know, maybe you're the memory leak, not us. So typically, we then have to be, find a way to reproduce this manually on the devices. And the other thing is, Michaela gladly showed you four lines of code of how you implement a test. And underneath that are hundreds of lines of code that does all the hard lifting. And to write those requires in-depth knowledge of Java. So it's not the sort of thing for um, a junior tester to write or a junior developer. It does require someone competent in Java. We found that writing the test, because we're digging into the guts of the application, means that we're highly coupled, which is undesirable. Lights on. OK, I'll, I'll hold it. What the heck? So it'll keep me awake, if not you lot. <laughs> so um, we basically have to implement new decorators for classes. That requires knowledge of the source code. Now, in comparison, RobotME doesn't need knowledge of the source code. It's able to put the instrumentation in um, without that. I'm not saying that it would do it that way, but it is possible. And we've chosen not to do record and playback because we want greater depth into calling our applications. So our testers, the people writing the test, need to understand our applications very well. And the changes do have side effects to the behavior of the application. Again, our instrumented code does slow things down slightly. And we need to maintain our changes as the application changes. So here's a very trivial example, before you all shoot me, um, of a typical problem we find in code, where a calculation is actually being performed in the draw method. Um, now, good software practice says you would do the calculation beforehand and then uh, display the results of that calculation. In our instrumentation, we've had to instrument the equivalent calculation um, to make sure we get the correct results, which is just bad, bad, bad. 
But that's what we do until such time as we're able to convince people to change their code, which generally happens. So before I actually move on to questions, I just want to make one little point about the joys of GTAC. So I was in New York last year, and I met Michaela there by chance in one of the breaks. Um, he was from Italy, he'd done his master's, and he was just starting his PhD in UCL. We got talking about J2ME, which is my subject in terms of testing, and he joined Google as an intern for three months. Um, we liked what he did, so he's a long-term intern at Google um, while we're waiting for him to finish his PhD. So he's done great work, and I'm very, very proud to have met him at GTAC. So with that, any questions? So Michele wants me to run the demo for you. Yeah. You can tell he's proud of his own work. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we are um, we are in the process of open, so of open sourcing it, so it will probably be downloadable in a few months. But at the moment, it, it hasn't been released yet. So other questions? I think we should have done the audience question and answer at this point. You said that you left it running overnight and you would come and see the results. So in practice, how many times is the phone completely cracked or hanged? So that there's nothing in there? Uh, so it, uh, what happened is that we have a continuous build. So in practice, all these tests runs every time there is a, like a new code checked in. And in, well, in general, uh, this should be used as a sort of regression test, but at the moment we are using it um, as a suite after the unit test. So um, what happened is that we actually find bugs which are going to be fixed like really soon. So basically, the, by the time I report them, the developer has already fixed them. That is what happened. Uh, in general, the suite always terminates. It doesn't happen that, that it crash. Uh, the reason why this happened is because we are, we are actually modeling tests as in, in a normal unit way. So we have a setup and a teardown, and if, if a test doesn't, doesn't complete uh, over a certain timeout, which is you know, like really long, we actually restore the initial state of the application if possible. If that is not possible, then we, we are forced to, to terminate the full suite because then the other tests will not be able to, to check the initial state. But that is really unlikely to happen. So um, in order to instrument um, a graphic library, like we need to have different instrumentation for each different library. Uh, the, the common principles are the same, uh, but we just need to support each different one. So it, like if, you have a, if your company has a custom library which they implemented internally, and you want this tool to, to test that library, you probably need to, to add a a set of uh, helper class which will help the test to, to interact with that library. But I mean, it's something that we did internally at least three times, and by the time we get experience with, with that, it doesn't take too much time. Actually, the co if your library is, is well designed, then it takes just a few time. Uh, sorry? So tests that are in pass and fail, that they Pass three times and they fail the fourth time. Uh, oh, flicky test. Um, <laughs> uh, well, if we, it's the same for any other unit test. If you have been like a good developer in writing your test, then your tests are not flicky. If you introduced uh, some like point, like for example, uh, when I was displaying the, the the layout of our test, we have those waiting point in which we need to wait for the application to load. So those are typically the most critical point. So if a tester is, mm, is good in writing the test, so it, it, 
it is able to explain exactly what it means to wait for the application to load, then those tests will, will always be correct. They will, all, they will only fail if something bad happened. But if the developer was lazy or uh, if he didn't have enough knowledge of the application and he put some, some condition which weren't completely correct, then that test can become flicky. But, so it, it happened to me to have a couple of tests which were flicky and uh, as we said before, if the code is not properly designed, so if the code smell is difficult to instrument it, so it, it happens a few times that the developer were trying to fix that code and as a result, some, some of our tests become flicky. At the beginning, they were failing one over a few times and then with more, the, the original code was changed, the more those tests were failing and then we had to refactor them. And the, the, the critical point is in the weight. That is the more complicated logic in the test. But it's usually, that is usually contained in some support API. So you are just to fix it once for your library and then when it's set, you can use it in all of your tests. Yes? So the short answer is yes. Uh, the, the real answer is uh, the, <laughs> the, the WTK from Sun already provides you an, a feature directly inside the emulator to, to, in, to introduce latency in the network. And that is introduced at the virtual machine level. And I, I strongly recommend you to do so instead of, if you, want, if you want to inject latency in your code, it's probably because you want to run it with latency directly in the device. but yeah, you can do that, but I mean, you can just run your test in, in a position in which your cell phone doesn't have a good connectivity, so it's much simpler. But yes, you can. Other questions? Free beer? <laughs> Not even that's going to stir them now. Okay, well, thank you very much, all.